Let me know if uh, you can if you cannot see my slides or you cannot hear me properly. Everything's perfect. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to talk about a paper I wrote recently with um, um, Ai Dong Do, who I former PhD student who is now a postdoc at Oxford University. Uh, the difficulty with presenting this work it's um, it's quite technical because uh, particle smoothing is a very technical topic. Um, I wrote a book on particle filters and uh, the chapter which took me more, which took us most time to write was the one on particle smoothing because there are many different algorithms and it's all a bit it's nothing very difficult but it's a, a lot of details so to speak right so i'm going to do something a bit original um i'm going to go through a preliminary section for 15 minutes i'm going to uh, explain the main ideas which you might be able to understand even if you know nothing about particle filters okay because the main ideas uh, are related to um, rejection sampling, Monte Carlo, basic stuff, complexity. And even if you know nothing about particle filtering, you should be uh, able to follow this part. And uh, maybe you will find interesting, even if you're not working on this in this area. Okay, that's my hope. And the second part, which are uh, just slide I took from Dong, to be honest, but uh, that's the first time I do this because Dong really, use the same notation I would use and say the thing exactly the way I would say it. So we're so on page that I can feel confident doing that. We'll get much more technical and uh, we'll apply these ideas in the context of particle smoothing, okay? Anything unclear, please interrupt me and ask me uh, questions, okay? So this is the, the outline. And again, I'm going to spend some time on preliminaries. And again, this is my co-author uh, Dong, Ai Dong Do. Who, with whom I worked this paper. Right, um, rejection sampling is a well-known algorithm. You want to sample from density P and your proposal is Q, provided you can bound it P by Q up to a factor C, up to a constant C, then you have this algorithm where you sample from Q and you accept with probability P of X over C Q X, all right? So I, I guess everybody is familiar with this uh, basic algorithm. And this basic algorithm has a peculiar property, which is its running time is random, OK? Um, the number of times you're going to repeat these two lines is going to follow a geometric distribution with parameter 1 over C. All right, it's easy to see, because every time you repeat, you, you make an attempt. And the probability of success is going to be uh, one over C, right? So by construction, the running time of your algorithm is random. Your algorithm is random. I mean, the output is random. That's that's uh, obvious. But also the running time is random, which is a bit less common, right? And then I'm going to ask you, um, or you can think about this question. I think a random execution time, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I, I usually ask this question to my students and um, usually they, they just uh, don't say anything, they don't have a, an ID. And then I try to explain that um, I think it's mostly a bad thing actually. Um, suppose you need to run the, this algorithm n times. Um, if you run it sequentially, the total running time is going to the sum of the random variables of this execution time. Okay. If in par in, um, instead you run it in parallel, then imagine you have uh, you can run this n algorithms on n distinct cores or n distinct devices. You have to wait until they are all completed. So then the total running time will be the max. So in um, probability and statistics, uh, the behavior of the sum of a random variable and the max of n random variables is, uh, is a well-studied subject. And uh, you know that uh, the behavior of this uh, 
total running time will depend on the tails of the distribution. Okay, so the first part uh, for the sum, you will have a central limit theorem, but it's assuming that the variance exists. So the tails are not so fat that you don't have an expect. You, you do have a moment of order one on two. And uh, when you look at the max, uh, again, you will find a certain condition on the tails to have certain behavior. Well, so um, what I'm trying to say is that um, when your algorithm has a random execution time, it means for, uh, whenever you run it, sometimes the execution time will be small and sometimes it will be large. Uh, if you sum, because you're running a non-parallel uh, implementation, uh, you might have some compensation provided the tails are not too thick. And that might have been even worse in a parallel implementation. You might think that uh, this discussion is a bit uh, useless because uh, I told you that uh, for rejection, you have a geometric distribution for the execution time, essentially. And the geometric be, it means exponential tail. So uh, the, the behavior of the sum of the max should be fine, okay? But we are going to face the following problem in, in our talk, that we're going to, uh, to run rejection sampling, but each time we do so, the proposal of the target change, okay? Uh, you can think of running a, a rejection sampling when the rate itself is random. Or in other words, the, the running time of my algorithm is not a geometric anymore, it's a mixture of geometric distribution. And then everything could happen. You could have very big tails, for instance. You could have infinite expectation, okay? And then if you have infinite expectation, even for the sum, it's dramatic, okay? It's going, means the total running time might have, uh, might, uh, there's some probability it gets very, very large. Um, all right, so to make this discussion a bit more concrete, now I'm going to consider uh, a specific class of problem. I want to sample from um, from a discrete distribution whose support is uh, the set of integers from one to capital N, okay? So capital N is not the number of sample I want to obtain. Capital N is the size of the, out of the support again, all right? And I know the probability of obtaining n according to p, it's given up to a constant by w n, all right? Um, there's a well-known method, which is equivalent to the inverse CDF method, which works as follows. First, you normalize the weight, that is you divide by your constant so that the sum is one. Then you sample a uniform and you try to find the index k such that uh, this inequality hold here. U is between the sum of Wm up to k minus one and the sum of Wm up to k. Okay, there's only one k that fulfills this, this uh, condition. And it's easy to check that the probability U that k is some value M will be since exactly Wm, right? So that's a simple approach. The execution time is going to be deterministic, but its complexity will be two of n. Okay, first because you normalize the weights. Okay, so you need to sum the to compute the sum of the weights, and second, if you need to find this index k, but on average, uh, you can uh, do at most uh, n operation. Okay, so it's not too bad, but if n is very large, you might want to consider alternatives. An alternative, which is, reject, is rejection sampling. And for instance, you could decide to uh, use a uniform proposal to do rejection. So that's, that requires you to bound Wn. Let's say you are, you're able to obtain a C such that Wn is lower or equal to C. And then you will do something like that. You sample from the uniform, you sample a uniform between zero and one, and you repeat these two steps until this condition is met. And you could say, and there are many papers at this point which say the complexity is two of one, okay? Because this, uh, these two operations, these two lines, um, the cost does not depend on n, 
okay? So they said two of one. I changed it a little bit here and I said two of P of one, okay? To emphasize the fact that the running time again now is random, okay? So yes, the complexity does not depend on N anymore, at least in uh, for fixed proposal, for, for fixed target, sorry, even fixed C. But it's still the case because the execution time is random, there's a probability that it's larger than the execution time of the previous algorithm, okay? By construction, it could be larger. Of course, in toy problems, this uh, probability will be extremely small, but in challenging problems where, for instance, C is very loose, that probability could be, uh, uh, no, uh, could be non negligible. Uh, and worse, you could be in a situation where you don't know whether your, this probability is large or not large. Okay, so you have two algorithms. This one takes a long time, but running time is deterministic. So you don't take any risks, the variance is zero. And this one, which might be fast, but with some probability could be very slow actually. So what you could do is an hybrid strategy where uh, you start with rejection sampling, you perform at most n trials, and if after n trials or n attempts, uh, you have not succeeded to obtain a, an output from a rejection sampling, you switch to the direct method. Okay, that's what I call a hybrid strategy. Uh, then it's easy to show that the running time of this hybrid strategy is going to be the minimum of the two, up to a constant, okay? Uh, running time or complexity, okay? There may be some constant missing here, but uh, you're always going to be uh, faster than the, the mean of the two, okay? And your running time is still uh, random, but now it's bounded. So in terms of, of uh, behavior of, uh, of the sum of the max of uh, N execution, it will be much better, okay? All right, okay, so I'm, that's more or less the end of my preliminary section. And why I wanted to present this ideas first, if, even they are completely de detached from particle smoothing, is that uh, in this way, you're not uh, um, lost by all the notation and details of particle filtering and smoothing. And what you're going to see next, or maybe what you're already expecting if you're familiar with particle smoothing, is that uh, the particles, uh, particle smoothing algorithm I'm going to discuss, they are such that you sample recursively from empirical distribution, okay? Uh, this empirical distribution will be of size N because you'll have N particles. And uh, there are different ways of doing that. Rejection is one popular approach, but it comes with uh, problems. And that's uh, part of the motivation of this uh, paper was to fix these problems, okay? And again, the point um, I'm making here is um, about the size N. Again, remember that uh, N is the size of a support, but you're going to do that just to obtain a single trajectory. And if you want to obtain two, three, four trajectories, you'll have to repeat the same algorithm, but this empirical distribution, they will change each time, okay? So it's like you, you need to do rejection, but you do it to do it only once. Maybe you will do it n times in the end, and uh, maybe you get complexity n square, for instance, if you do the direct method, et cetera, et cetera. And also as an appetizer, uh, here are some, um, some remarks. Another example of a, an algorithm with a deterministic running time is just MCMC. But you could think, why will you do MCMC if we can do a da direct sampling or rejection sampling because MCMC is biased. So something very funny is going to happen in this talk today. We are going to be in a situation when you can do MCMC with a starting point, which is already in the right distribution, okay? So again, talking about this particular problem of sampling from um, a distribu uh, discrete distribution with a support one to N, uh, I'm going to do MCMC and it's going to beat uh, all the other methods I've discussed so far. 
So that's a bit surprising, but anyway, so I'm done with this. I would like to uh, explain the context now of part uh, why do what is smoothing or why do we want to do smoothing? Okay, so we consider a state space model. This is a model where uh, you have data y0, y1, yt, etc. And uh, there's also an, an underlying a Markov chain x, xt, right? But you don't observe the xt's, you just observe the yt's, which are noisy version of the xt's essentially, okay? So xt is a unobserved uh, non homogeneous Markov process. Essentially, is the state of your system. And you observe yt, which is a noisy observation of xt. MT uh, is going to denote the Markov kernel that uh, generates xt given xt minus one. Okay, and uh, we will admit, uh, we will assume that this Markov kernel admits some uh, probability density small MT. Okay, some example um, target tracking, for instance, six or uh, navigation xt could be the position of your car on a 2D map. And YT will be some measurement you acquire from GPS, okay? Which is obviously noisy. I mean, you could uh, you could have uh, some satellite measurement uh, hidden by a building, whatever. Uh, second example in finance, where um, YT is um, is some uh, log return of a finance asset, and you model uh, the um, only the variance of this process, which is exponential of xt. In other words, what is called the volatility, and you assume an autoregressive uh, model for the volatility. Okay, so xt is not observed, but you observe a yt. You can do the same kind of stuff maybe in a continuous time, but you will observe uh, yt's only at discrete times. So. We are specifically considering the offline smoothing problem, which is you want to simulate the trajectory of the axes given the data, okay? Or to recover the posterior distribution, to use a Bayesian uh, uh, terminology, uh, to recover the distribution on the hidden variables given the data from time zero to time t. There are some examples where you can uh, actually compute uh, the density of xt given xt minus one, and other example like this one in continuous time where uh, the, the, this density is intractable. Okay, and uh, you might want to do smoothing in both cases, and that will present uh, different challenges. The second example will be second case will be more challenging. Okay, um, what about online smoothing? Online smoothing is the same, except you want to do it recursively at every time t. So for instance, something like that. Oops, sorry, the first equation. Here we're looking specifically at the case where um, the expectation of the smoothing distribution is uh, additive. And this kind of scenario uh, occurs in particular in parameter estimation, right? So this is, um, a well-known uh, trick in um, latent variable models. <clears throat> Here I'm writing the uh, the log density of the data, so so the likelihood, okay, but it depends on some parameter theta. And if I try to compute the gradient of the log likelihood, it turns out that I can rewrite it as an expectation of this quantity, the first factor. Sorry, the first factor here. Uh, so it's an expectation of this with respect to the smoothing distribution, okay? So a well-known kind of identity that is also uh, arise often in the EM algorithm, etc. Okay, so if you look at this first factor, it is, it is the gradient of a log joint density, and it actually, uh, it is additive. You can decompose it into a sum of terms each term depending only on xt and xt minus one, okay? Anyway, so if you want to do parameter estimation in state space model, uh, you could do it in different ways. Maybe you want to do a gradient descent, then um, in order to do so, you need to be able to compute expectation with respect to the smoothing distribution. 
And if you want to do online estimation, then you need online smoothing, okay? Uh, alternatively, you might want to do uh, online smoothing just because you want to monitor uh, the current value of the XTs. Okay, let me skip this slide because I'm a bit late, I think. Right, so the thing you need to know about particle filtering, if it's something you really don't know anything about, is that a particle filter is a kind of a sequential Monte Carlo algorithm. So it's sequential. You do something at every time t. And it's Monte Carlo because you carry forward um, n particles, n random variables. The xt1, xt2, etc. are my particles. And they come with weights, wtn. And the particles with their weights approximate the filtering density at time t as follows. Okay, if I compute this uh, weighting average for phi of xtn, it's, uh, it's going to approximate the expectation of function phi relative to this moving distribution. Okay, so as always in Monte Carlo, uh, you um, approximate an expectation with, uh, uh, with uh, some weighted average, which is an, an expectation with respect to some. Uh, empirical distribution. That's what that's all what I'm saying. Okay, so by construction of this algorithm at every time t, it will come with n simulation, xtn, and n weights. Okay, so this is filtering. And also another thing you need to know if you're new to particle filters is that uh, there are some kind of genetic algorithms. Uh, each particle xtn has an ancestor. And um, if you want to look if I'm talking about ancestry, I can draw um, a genealogical tree. This is my genealogical tree. You see, at time 100, uh, I have 100 distinct particles with indices uh, the 1 to n. And I, here I plot the index of its ancestor and the index of the ancestor of the ancestor. And uh, quickly, in time, you realize that your 100 final particles they have only one common ancestor at time 40, 30, etc. Okay, this kind of uh, uh, trajectory coalescence is uh, pretty well known in this context and is also something that happens in uh, similar um, uh, probability uh, models like uh, weak fissure, genetic, etc. Uh, it's a uh, pretty common. It's called uh, coalescence. Okay, so you have this. Um, uh, degener population degeneration phenomenon in this kind of algorithm. The reason why I'm mentioning that is because uh, one way to do particle smoothing would be just to carry forward the complete trajectory. Okay, so remember here I said that a particle filter at time t, you have particles xtn, but you could also record it's uh, the value of its ancestor and the ancestor of the ancestor, and then you will approximate the complete smoothing distribution. But you can see from this plot, it's not going to work very well because by construction, you're, uh, you will have n trajectories. But for the first 40 time steps, they will be identical, so, which is not very good when you do Monte Carlo. If you do Monte Carlo with a n times the same value, you can expect the variance to be super large, of course. OK? So uh, there's a class of uh, possibly the most popular class of uh, smoothing algorithms, they rely on, uh, on a backward step, which is an extra step you do in this game of uh, algorithm, and we, which is based on this decomposition here. Okay, This is the distribution of xt minus 1 given xt on the complete data. Okay, And you can rewrite it like this. Okay, and you, Essentially, you're using Markov properties. Uh, is proportional to the filtering density at time t minus one times the Markov transition from x t minus one to x t. And if I plug the empirical approximation of a filter, which which has obtained by my particle filtering algorithm, I get for this distribution some something like that, which is a, again an empirical distribution. The, the, the logic behind it is that is that follows. This backward decomposition gives, tells me that 
my uh, smoothing distribution, if you go backwards, is still Markov. So you can still sample uh, x capital T, then x t minus 1 given x t, then x t minus 2 given x t minus 1. So it, it's just a Markov simulation going backwards. And you can actually approximate this uh, backward Markov kernel like this by an empirical measure. And this simply means if you give me a value of xt, which is the current uh, value of xt in my simulation, I can take for xt minus 1 one of the n of these n values, the xt minus 1 n, that's my n particles, and the weight, the probability I should uh, uh, select this particular value, value will be proportional to wt minus 1 n times this function, okay, which is the Markov uh, density. Okay, so again, if you're a bit lost, I'm just saying when you do particle smoothing, one way to do that is to sample recursively from a finite distribution whose support is essentially one, two until capital N. You already have a, like a grid of N values, the X T minus one N, they were fixed for you, and you have some weights. But if you give me a value of xt, these weights will depend on it. So each time you sample a trajectory, you sample a single point for each time t, but the support of your distribution is of size n. So exactly the problem I've described in the preliminary step. Okay? Is everything all right? Because I don't really see you, so I hope everything is, yeah? Thank you. Uh, unless anyone wants to ask anything, is, is uh, Raoul? No, no. I think it's fine, Nicola. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, so you really have this kind of problem. Okay. This has this structure, and if you play with it a little bit, you can uh, write it into um, some kind of uh, matrix. Um, uh, what to say it? Uh, some, some, you can rewrite all the computation you need in matrix form. And these matrices, before I give you the details, they very much look like the same matrices and computation you do for a, a finite hidden Markov models. Okay, essentially. So if you don't know about status model, but you know about hidden Markov models, it's the same kind of thing. Okay. Uh, for instance, here, the expectation of for a, only x0 can be rewritten like this. Here you have um, a line and you have a product of matrices and you have this vector and the matrices, they are like that. That, that the probability you go from n to n prime is proportional to this. It's exactly the same uh, stuff as this one, okay? Right, so um, I'm just rewriting in terms of matrices, the kind of, uh, uh, in, in terms of um, transition matrices, the kind of simulation I need to do to do my, my uh, backward smoothing algorithm. Okay, and you can uh, rewrite. Uh, you can compute recursively here this product of matrices like this. Okay, so anyway, don't try to really understand it uh, finely. Uh, just look at the big pictures. It's just uh, essentially matrix calculation, sequential matrix calculation, and the going from n to n prime, which means we're going from x t n to x minus one n prime, the probability of that is proportional to this. Okay. Sorry, I have a question now. Yeah. Thank you very much. So so the whole point is that to do this moving now, um, this, this probabilities as you compute backwards, they will not collapse and be trivial and, and, and concentrate on a single trajectory. Is that so? Yes, exactly, because, it, yes, it's a very good point, it's exactly. Um, when you do the naive thing, you have no choice. You have to go back in time looking at your ancestry, and then you have uh, this um, uh, degeneracy. But now with this computation, you're trying to, to take as an ancestor every possible uh, n, at every time t, you consider as a potential ancestor the n the n particles. Sure, but I mean yeah. this method will work if you put non-trivial probabilities on top of them. If everything still yeah, collapses yeah, yeah. And, but... and one of them can concentrates on the probability, you still have the same thing, right? So yeah, this yeah, is but going that's to diffuse why you... somehow the probability. 
Yeah, but okay, okay, exactly. But if you use these matrices, you have uh, you you solve this problem essentially because uh, they are non trivial and uh, you allow every state to communicate to every other state. Yeah, so it's like a diffusion process uh, that is running in in the backward direction, so it will smooth yeah, out yeah, the problem. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, you're fixing the problem, but then you have uh, the issue that these matrices they are n by n. So if you do it naively you will end up with a complexity n square. Okay, so the, the problem is uh, fixed, but now we have a computational problem, which is it's a bit expensive. I hope that's answer your question. Hmm. And uh, one way to understand the Paris algorithm, which is a par uh, algorithm proposed by uh, Jimmy Olson and, and Wen Sterborn a few years ago, what they did to uh, to address this n square problem I've just mentioned is that uh, they replace this matrix by an unbiased estimate. So what they do, they sample twice from BTN for a fixed n, and then you allow a transition from n to k with probability one half for only those k which are equals to these two samples. Okay, so it's not the way uh, Olson and Westerborn uh, explain their algorithms, but uh, I think this way of explaining it uh, is nice too. Is that you had this full matrix, which was n square, and you replace by a, a sparse matrix, which is random, but which has the proper expectation, okay? And uh, the advantage of Paris is that because the matrix is sparse, you don't have the n square problem, but there are drawbacks, I will, as I will show you. Okay, so now let's make the connection back to the preliminary section. Uh, again, we have this problem that we have matrices where to go from n to n prime. Uh, Sorry to bother you. Can I ask yeah, a yeah. question? Yeah, because it, this thing was very interesting. You, you said that you have a product of matrices and then each of them is going to be sampled by unbiasedly. Mm -hmm. So how do you track the, the bias on the product essentially? Everything is in independent in this in this context or conditionally independent? Uh, to, to allow so, you to I mean in Paris uh, your um, your uh, sparse matrix is a non biased is an uh, its expectation is the true uh, btn at so you don't introduce a bias exactly so all all of these are done independently in the product right so there's no no issue yeah. with the, the the bias that's what i'm asking yeah 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 great thank you um, okay, so we have these matrices, they are n square. Uh, for a fixed n, if you want to sample from it and you use the direct method I had told you, then it would cost two of n. So if you want to do n this n times, you have a complexity n square. Uh, so because of this, people have proposed, uh, in particular in this paper, Duke Garivier, Moulin, and Olson, they are proposed to use rejection. So they assume that you can upper bound this density MT and uh, they use rejection uh, using as a proposal, not a, I, I think in their paper they said uniform, but you can more generally sample from, um, from the, the weights, okay? So in this way, you have a proposal that does not depend on N, okay? And in their paper, they claim that the complexity of their algorithm is two of n. And this is true if mt is lower bounded. But what uh, we prove in this in our paper is that um, um, <coughs> this is not true in general. So the first point to make is that mt is never lower bounded in application. People still claim that the proposed algorithm by uh, by um, Duke et al is uh, as linear complexity, but in practice, sometimes doesn't work very well. And um, some people have uh, proposed this hybrid strategy uh, I mentioned before, but the question that were not answered before this paper is that what exactly are the mathematical properties of execution time of rejection if you don't have this condition that MT is lower bounded? Uh, how much you improve if you do this hybrid strategy or early starting, and how do you choose the, the threshold? Okay. 
So uh, what we prove is that uh, if you do, uh, for instance, this Paris, Paris algorithm using rejection, the um, execution time is um, as infinite expectation. Okay, this sounds bad, and uh, to be fair, it is bad because uh, the reason, what motivated me in the first place to do this uh, work, was that I implemented Paris and. Uh, I uh, ran it in parallel because I could, and uh, it never completed. Or I had to wait a few days, and one uh, one of the execution took days, where the other one would complete in a, in a few seconds. Okay, and uh, I could not understand why. And so I started to think about this and think more and talk to Dong about it. And uh, in the end, we did this paper. So uh, it really kills you when an algorithm is uh, has execution time, which is uh, uh, with, which with fat tails or even infinite expectation. It's really a problem. I mean, believe me, it's just not a theoretical uh, view. It's uh, really annoying. Um, what we also prove in this paper is that if we do the hybrid strategy instead, and if we decide to stop after n trials, then you get complexity, which is n times some log n power something, okay? So that's pretty cool because it's a big improvement. It's a finite running time and the complexity is not linear, but a bit, uh, a bit above linear. And uh, we do the same for, um, so these slides I discuss mostly Paris, but FFBS as the, the well-known uh, uh, method for smoothing has also the same problems essentially, or similar problems. Um, I'm running a bit late, but um, anyway, um, why thresholding works so well? I mean, what we show in, essentially is that um, uh, the running time of our algorithm, it behaves a bit like exponential of x squared over two when x is Gaussian. And it's clear that the, this quantity has infinite expectation, but if you truncate it with n, a simple calculation, which is given on this slide, will give you uh, a bound, which is like square root of log of n. So it's funny because uh, thresholding at n has this dramatic uh, impact. It's uh, you go from infinity to log of, square root of log of n, which grows very uh, slowly with n. So apparently, thresholding like that really helps a lot. Um, I am I have some time left, so let me discuss briefly MCMC. Uh, again, Excuse remember, me, Nicola, yeah, yeah. You, you, you have about 20 to 25 minutes, so, so no need to rush too much. Oh, thanks. Okay, I thought you might want to give me 10 no, minutes. For it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay, okay, I do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm a bit nervous because it's the first time I give this talk and I don't, I'm not sure exactly how much time I'm going to spend on each part. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to say, um, again, we have this problem where, sorry, we want to sample recursively from these matrices, essentially, okay? We discuss the direct method, we discuss rejection. What about MCMC? Okay, MCMC could be a valid way to sample from this. And um, if you do it uh, in a clever way, maybe the complexity will be deterministic and two of one, okay? All right? So, uh, what we're going to do, so recall in Paris, we sample twice from um, the true uh, distribution, and then we allow only uh, two possible transitions from n to k, okay? Which is a very interesting idea. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a very, it's quite, uh, it's quite original to think in this way. But what we're going to do, is that we are going to do the same. We're going to sample once from the true distribution. And we're going to use that for the starting point uh, uh, MCMC algorithm. And maybe we're going to do one MCMC steps or five or 10, but a fixed number like that, okay? So then the execution time is, um, is uh, deterministic. And uh, in practice, we observe it's much faster than rejection. Um, because again, we're going to do actually in the end only one step. And uh, the, this idea of the hybrid uh, rejection, sometimes you have to uh, 
to do 20, 10 or 20 trials. Okay. Oh, I forgot to say, um, no, I, okay. Um, so this idea is not new as uh, some referees pointed to us when we sent the paper to a journal. And actually uh, Simon Godsteel and uh, Pete Bunch, I think his first name is Pete, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. They, they proposed some idea like that, okay? But they did not prove any results. They just say, oh, let's do this, it seems to work. And a big uh, challenge for us, uh, maybe that was the most difficult result to obtain was to prove that when you do that, you do get uh, a scientifically stable result. Let me explain later what I mean by that. Um, but anyway, um, we're going to be able to prove that this kind of approach works well, is stable, and you also have uh, some kind of CLT. So this is the kind of uh, result we obtain in the paper. Uh, the algorithm we do, when we use it to approximate an expectation of an additive function, the error behaves like that. Okay, so capital T is um, the number of time steps and capital N is the number of particles. And you can see that it's, uh, it still goes to zero uh, and then goes to infinity, but more importantly, it does not uh, blow up too much when T increases. okay? Uh, if we, here you have a sum of a T and you have a square root of T, but it's not too bad, it's polynomial, okay? So that's the main, uh, the most important or most challenging result in the paper. You still have stability even if you use this MCMC approach um, to, to, to generate the ancestors. And again, the, your, your complexity is not exactly tau of n, okay? Right. So in a few minutes, I'm going to explain one more idea in the paper, but briefly. Um, in the paper, we also discuss the problem of doing particle smoothing where you, you're not, when you are not able to compute the transition density. This is known as the intractable dynamics problems in, uh, in this area. And uh, it's, a, it's quite challenging. I mean, uh, there are a lot of uh, algorithms you're not able to do as soon as you cannot compute this uh, density. I'm not saying it does not exist. I'm just saying it exists, but it's, you're not able to compute it point-wise. And again, uh, a continuous time, time um, hidden process is a good example of that. I mean, you have some diffusion here. You will observe... Um, xt um, at some discrete times plus noise, but the transition will be intractable typically. Unless, of course, the drift is linear, etc., etc. But you can sample from it using uh, some kind of fine uh, discretization. Okay. Right. Uh, so, and this goes back a bit to a question that I was asked at the beginning. Uh, the problem with genealogy tracking, remember, is that. Uh, each uh, particle at time t is allowed to have only a single ancestor. So one way to solve the problem or to understand how we solve the problem is to allow for more than one ancestors, essentially, okay? Uh, the direct method, you allow for n possible ancestors. Paris, there were only two, but two is really already much better than one. It's the, from one to two, that makes all the difference, okay? So to, to, uh, to obtain a system where we have uh, a particle with two ancestors, what we do is coupling, okay? Uh, that is, we transform, we, we change the, um, the initial particle filtering algorithm. And uh, what you do is that um, uh, for each at, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, when you have two resemble particles, sorry, Sorry, when you have two resampled particles, x t minus one and x t minus one prime, what you're going to do is to simulate them using coupling to uh, make the probability that they match, that the two x t match as large as possible, okay? If you know about uh, maximal coupling, you, you know what I'm trying to say here. If not, uh, forget it. Uh, if there is a whole area of probability uh, designed to, 
then uh, we, which exist to design such couplings. Okay, and if you manage to couple, then you have an XT value that automatically have two ancestors. Okay, and this kind of coupling construction is something you can do even if a transition density is not tractable. So essentially, that's how it works. We transform the the particle filtering algorithm. So you know, in, instead of having two n particles, we have two n particles and they form pairs and these pairs they always try to couple at time t their value. And if you manage to couple, you have uh, two ancestors. So you don't automatically always get two ancestors, but the fact that you, from time to time, you may get two ancestors is enough to fix this um, coalescence problem, okay? And uh, this is explained here, okay? But uh, again, I'm, uh, I wanted to conclude quickly. So uh, you can have a look at so that's some uh, result from the paper, but I urge you to read the paper instead because it, it's going to be hard for me to explain really the details in the few minutes left. So I'll rather skip that if you don't mind. Um, so I'd like to conclude because um, I like to re explain what are the main messages here. Um, you have some state space model, you want to do smoothing and the way you want to do smoothing is uh, essentially you want to uh, really simulate the smoothing distribution. So uh, maybe it's offline, maybe it's online. You can do the direct method if you want, but it's going to cost you n square. It's not so bad, but if n is large, our recommendation is always to use this MCMC strategy we propose in the paper. The CPU cost is very low, and it works really well in practice. We have not found uh, cases where it does not uh, perform satisfactorily. So we are very happy with it. Um, if you have some reason to uh, suspect MCMC is not working well for you, uh, you could do this hybrid rejection sampler we propose in the paper. Okay, so again, you do rejection, but after n trials, you stop and you do the direct method. And stopping, early stopping like, like that, you're going to help you dramatically. The difference between not doing it and doing it is just, it's just really impressive in practice. It really makes a, a big difference. So again, if you're running a weather in parallel or, or not, it really means between uh, having near under, uh, having results in seconds to having results in maybe after a few hours. So it's that, it's that big. Uh, we suspect that the reason why people did not see that this before is that we are always running uh, this uh, rejection sampling algorithm with a very small value of n. But the larger n, the worse the performance of this algorithm, so to speak. Uh, if you have an untractable dynamics problem, please have a look at this coupling construction because it looks very, it's a pretty uh, novel idea and uh, everybody seems to like it. I mean, referees, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's that's a nice approach. Uh, the paper is an archive is currently uh, in revision in Annals of Statistics. And um, there are some numerical experiments I did not include in the paper, in the, in the slides, sorry, but they are in the, in the paper. They were performed by Dong. And uh, I re-implemented uh, the algorithm in um, this uh, Python package I'm developing called Particles. Uh, and I'm uh, in this way, uh, we have a double, um, uh, I mean, I mean, we, 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 we have, a re I was able to repeat some of the experiment and confirm that it works exactly as expected. And also uh, in this way, the sum of a smoothing algorithm implemented in particles used by default, this uh, method we recommend, okay? So for instance, if you really try to use uh, rejection, uh, by default, it will stop after n trials to avoid the pitfalls uh, we mentioned. Okay, but in the documentation, we also say you should do this MCMC uh, stuff instead. Okay, and uh, in using particles again, we observe that the MCMC uh, approach is much faster. Uh, it's not completely fair because um, in Python and other interpreted languages, rejection sampling is by construction a bit slow because you're doing this loop. But it, you could also say that it's an extra reason not to do rejection and to, to stick with MCMC. And I think I'm done. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Nicola, for that very nice talk. Do we have any questions from the audience on this? Uh, Raul, please. Thank you very much for the nice talk. I just have one one justification okay. question. If you, on top of doing the smoothing, you also have to sort of do some inference for parameters that drive the dynamics, is there any change that you would like to remark or is more or less straightforward? Uh, no, I mean, what I'm going to say is a bit straightforward. Usually, I mean, often people do EM, VM algorithm. And for the EM algorithm, at every time, t uh, at every time uh, you're, going, you're going to need to compute a smoothing expectation, and then uh, you will, should follow exactly the same recommendation I've just given you, because you need, you need to do particle smoothing. So, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, parameter estimation in state space models, the, the main uh, uh, difficulty is doing smoothing. I mean, I mean, they are essentially, I mean, you could do EM or you could do uh, uh, some kind of gradient descent. Every time you need the smoothing distribution, it's, it's hard to get around the smoothing problem. So the main problem is smoothing. Thank you. If any more questions? Okay, so I'll ask one because this is so. This is my my area. Um, so the question is related to the the, the diffusions case, which you, which you uh, uh, discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit in the talk so that there would be two potential strategies here so what especially when you have to discretize if you necessarily you have to discretize one strategy would in your context would be you plug the euler approximation into your first approach right so then you pay a you're going to pay a bias whatever or the other one would be that you you still do the simulation from the euler discretization but you use the coupling so it's been uh, several months since I read your report. So I, I don't know if this is in the paper, but can you do you have any, any insight in which strategy might be better or, or is, is it unclear? Uh, I'm not. I'm, I, I'm not sure. It's not obvious. Yeah, this, this is no. what I thought. It's not. It's not no. not trivially obvious. I guess. So yeah. you mean in in the second approach because we do coupling, we don't have discrete. In the second it, case, you will not have a discretization bias, right? Because you you will as you assume you're able to simulate from the exactly yes. from the dynamics, right? Uh, the, so I'm saying that you 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 can't even do that. So you have to discretize necessarily. Ah, okay. So There's do, no yeah. no other way. Yeah. Um. I'm not entirely sure. I will ask Dong what is his opinion. Um, the, this coupling construction is very nice, but it's also a bit, uh, it's more work to implement, to be honest, because it's also change the, 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 the forward path. So you need a strong motivation to do it. Oh, okay. So understood. I would say okay. at least maybe, maybe in, even in the case you mentioned, you will get some benefit. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I am, we are not making any claim at the moment on that. We're just saying, uh, in case you have intractable uh, dynamics that you can sample exactly, then there's little you can do, you could do this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's a very good point. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Yeah. So if we have no further questions, let's thank Nicola again. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. That concludes this morning's session. So we return at half past one with uh, Nicholas Cantas. Thank you again, Nicola. Thank you. I will stop sharing now. Have a